the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast is back for another episode. Join Mark S. Ryan, a veteran health plan and health technology executive, as he explores the world of healthcare. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. My name is Mark Ryan, and it's a pleasure to be hosting the podcast. And thanks to everyone for listening in. I expect that this week's podcast will be a, a shorter one than not. The title of it is, Is America Getting the Value It Deserves from Part D? And uh, this really comes from a recent uh, April 18th, 2023 JAMA Forum article that really discussed whether the U.S. is again getting its bang for the buck with Medicare Part D. And the results to me were rather shocking. When we go to the doctor or engage in the healthcare system, we really take for granted that when a doctor, for example, prescribes a drug, it is the right move for us. But America has so much drug marketing by big pharma that doctors and our decision making may actually be skewed. At least that is what the JAMA Network article points to. And we're going to go a little deeper into that and and just discuss the status of Part D, and where we're actually spending our money. First, what I'd like to sort of do is think about the differences in healthcare systems around the world. As I often talk about, I believe our healthcare system is the best if you can afford it. And what I mean by that is if you're well-heeled, have a lot of money, or in the alternative, have great healthcare coverage, Uh, which many of us are privileged to have, uh, you can really get as much as you want. Uh, You can get the best care possible. You can get your drugs filled uh, largely without major problems. You can live a really good, healthy life. Your premiums could be expensive, admittedly, but if you're willing to pay for that and can afford to pay for it, Your hassles are a lot less. You're getting the best care. You have good networks. You have a good health insurer, and you have constant delivery. Now, we know that that's not the case for many people. There are tens of millions of uninsured. There are probably somewhere around 85 million who are either underinsured or um, uninsured, and that creates huge problems for accessing care in the system and getting quality care. If we contrast that with what happens in other developed world nations, they largely have guaranteed universal access to health care. There are many, many different models out there in the developed world. They sort of go into about three groupings. Uh, They have socialized medicine, which is what happens in the United Kingdom. They have single payer, which, for example, happens in France and Canada, which is not exactly socialized medicine. But in the single payer system, the government runs the healthcare system and contracts with others. But in both cases, they are universal access systems. Care is subsidized to the extent that everyone is able to get the same kind of quality access to the system. And thirdly, you also have private affordable universal access where private entities run the healthcare system, provide the care directed by the government. Good examples here are Germany and the Netherlands. But in all three of these types in the rest of the developed world, the key feature is universal access. Everybody is getting care at an affordable price or rate. Uh, Much of the time, the government pays for most of it, but there are also obviously, uh, based on income scales, amounts that you may put in as a citizen. So that big difference is we don't have universal access in the United States. We took a small step there with the Affordable Care Act, but really haven't gotten there given the level of uninsured and underinsured And in the rest of the world, there is that universal access. Well, another factor that really comes into discussing the differences between the U.S. and the rest of the developed world is, again, the health systems in the rest of the developed world are heavily regulated. And what I mean by that is 
what you get in the healthcare system is limited by the decisions largely by the government entity that is setting policy. So in many of these countries, in most of them actually, you have national uh, boards that decide what is covered in the health system, perhaps from a medical and a procedure standpoint, and more importantly, what's on a drug formulary. Now, there are certainly pros and cons to that. On one hand, again, everybody has universal access to services and to drugs. But on the other hand, that national board or that national policymaking entity will potentially ration care. And they can ration care in a couple of different ways. In one way, it's to explicitly say only these services and these drugs are covered and other drugs and services are not covered, but in a different way, and we see a lot of this happening today in the developed world, global budgeting and investments in healthcare can be limited. And that creates implicit rationing related to wait times, the number of specialists as an example, the number of high-tech facilities and things like that. In the drug world, which we're really talking about today, um, you, you have these explicit drug formulary lists where the national body decides based on both the price and the comparative effectiveness of the drugs about whether those drugs are going to be on that national drug list. Here in the United States, as we know, big pharma sort of controls everything. Uh, there's no real price controls on our system except for the brand new ones that we see in Medicare uh, drug price negotiations. Only about 10 drugs so far have price setting. So largely, we have an unfettered system of as many drugs coming to the market as possible. Uh, the drug makers then work with PBMs offering rebates to get their drugs on a drug formulary. Uh, so by and large, you can either pay out of pocket for any drug you want uh, or try to get that drug covered by your health plan through your PBM. We have massive drug marketing in this country. So even I have done this in the past. You see something on TV, you go to your doctor and ask whether you can have that drug because you saw it on TV and you think it might be the best for you, whether that's true or not. Doctors are also uh, incredibly influenced by drug marketing as well. That comes through TV advertising, but it also comes through a whole network of drug pharmacy representatives that are hired by companies that go out to doctor's office and peddle drugs. And given the amount of time that doctors can today spend with patients or on care, uh, they may be heavily influenced by uh, those drug marketing efforts. And so what this JAMA Forum article uh, gets to, if we get back to it here, to bring it all together, is that in America, there is a lot of drug spending on drugs that may or may not be necessary, number one, for a population, or number two, could be excessively priced. And there are other drugs that are just as effective, that are cheaper, that actually may be more legacy in nature, but can do just as well. And what the uh, article points out is that there are different ways that these other developed countries essentially determine the comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness of drugs. And if you look at data, and in this case, it was from the Medicare Part D program, you can clearly find that there's a vast amount of spending that is unnecessary or uh, comes from drugs that are overly expensive and they do not have that comparative effectiveness or cost effectiveness compared to what is done in other nations. So with that introduction, we'll take our first break and we will be right back to go deeper into this topic. Health plans and insurance are confusing. Our healthcare system is in dire need of reform. 
Health policy expert Mark Ryan tackles both issues in his book, The Healthcare Labyrinth. It is both a guide to navigating health plans and fixing American health insurance. Mark dives deep into how health plans and the American health insurance system operate. He then outlines a comprehensive reform agenda for the system as a whole, including pricing, emphasizing health and care management, and ensuring affordable access to health coverage and a private delivery model. Mark is a bit of an unconventional Republican in that he believes affordable access is the morally right thing to do and that it is also fiscally prudent for our nation. Learn more about Mark's book, The Healthcare Labyrinth, at healthcarelabyrinth.com or search at leading bookseller websites. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook forms. Welcome back. Uh, we hope you're enjoying this episode of the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. We're talking about whether America gets the value it deserves from Part D, the senior drug retail program that was set up in 2006. So, um, as I said, there are entities within other developed countries that sort of assess whether given services, uh, technologies, and drugs actually should be included in the national program. And uh, what the JAMA Network Assessment article did here was ask the following question, quote, what was the added therapeutic benefit of the top 50 selling drugs in Medicare in 2020 as assessed by key non-U.S. health technology assessment organizations. So these health technology assessment organizations are essentially the entities which are, again, assessing the technology, the drugs, and the services that should or should not be included in a national health care program. And so uh, they are making these assessments, they're making these judgments based on scientific evidence. Uh, admittedly, as I noted, that budgets can also come into play here. So we're not saying that everything is perfect in these other systems, but they are trying to determine cost effectiveness, which I believe is a very important component in a national budget, no matter how you do it, as well as comparative effectiveness. Is a drug, a service, a technology better than what else is on the market at this time? Is it comparatively effective, this new item, to the others that are out there? And then, of course, you bring into cost effectiveness as well. So again, in a uh, HTA or a health technology assessment is undertaken by a public and private entity around the world to assess, again, the clinical effectiveness, cost effectiveness, and of course, safety of a given proposed drug, device, test, procedure, and more in the healthcare system. In its broadest form, an HTA will also include an analysis of the ethical, social, and legal considerations. In theory, these assessments would steer the nation to a safe and outcome-oriented health system. But again, I note that there are budgetary concerns that enter the picture too. With regard to drug approvals in other developed countries, again, comparative clinical effectiveness that is, whether the drug offers greater health benefits than others and cost effectiveness take on a major role. These assessments essentially dictate whether the drug will be placed on what I call the national or planned drug list or formulary, as well as what the price will be in that national system. So in these other developed nations, you have a number of different ways of arriving at prices of drugs. Once that assessment is done, you'll determine whether that drug should be included. You'll enter into negotiations with drug makers. Um, and in some cases, international reference pricing is used. That's where a nation will compare uh, the prices in other developed countries and either take the lowest price or some kind of average or just use it as a benchmark to decide whether the country is getting a fair price in that negotiation with the drug maker. As we know, drug prices in other countries, developed countries, are dramatically lower than in the U.S. Uh, there are statistics that say uh, they're more than twice as expensive on average, but in some cases, 
the cost could be three, four, and five times in the United States what they are in other developed nations, depending on that drug. So Americans are at very much a disadvantage when it comes to the drug costs. And that clearly impacts access and things like that as well. So again, what happens here in the United States? Let's go a little deeper into that because uh, we have just talked about the health technology assessments and the comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness studies that other developed nations do. What exactly do we do here? And I've already referenced it. So if other nations zero in on these comparative effectiveness as well as cost effectiveness, as I've in talked about in the intro, America's system largely looks at the clinical effectiveness and safety. If the drug is found to be both, it gets approved by the Food and Drug Administration, regardless of its relative value against other drugs in the same or similar therapeutic class. So again, the FDA is going to allow anybody to come into the system under our, our regulatory paradigm as long as it is clinically effective, that's one important part. It has to do what the drug maker says it's doing. And number two, is it safe? Do the clinical studies show that it is safe and that the impacts in other areas are not major and that the clinical effectiveness uh, is good? Now, I am a critic of the Food and Drug Administration I do not believe it really does its job on clinical effectiveness or safety. I think in many ways, the Food and Drug Administration is inept. I think it's a bureaucracy that is badly run uh, and it's not doing its job. I believe that brand drug makers are essentially greedy and are putting drugs through the pipeline that are not clinically effective or safe in the Food and Drug Administration is not really doing its job on those two core functions. But what's most important, again, to state here is the FDA is not looking at comparative effectiveness or even the cost effectiveness of the drug. It's just sort of looking at that clinical effectiveness and safety. And so the relative value, as I noted, against other drugs in the same or similar therapeutic classes are not being evaluated here. Now, America is inching toward comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness in evaluating drugs. We do not have an HTA type agency or agencies as in other developed nations, but the Inflation Reduction Act's Medicare drug price negotiations mandate that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services look at these issues of comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness when they're negotiating with the drug makers on drugs. And as I've talked about in other podcasts, there's going to be about 60 drugs that ultimately are negotiated over the next several years and then more after that. Those are both in the Part D retail program and in, and in the Part B medical drug program. And theoretically, comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness begin to take a little more importance, at least from the CMS standpoint, if not from the FDA standpoint. The Kaiser Family Foundation has issued several briefers on the drug price law. And at my blog site at healthcarelabyrinth.com, I have posted uh, them. And I think you can go there to look a little more about exactly how comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness come into play here. Again, first 10 drugs have prices set for 26 already, uh, but we don't know yet what factors CMS actually use to consider each of the drugs against others in the market in terms of comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness. What we can surmise about what's happened so far is that this was just a very first step I'd call it a rather immature first step. That's not a criticism of CMS, but by nature, they go slow and they have to really master what they're doing. So I doubt very much that a lot was done in comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness, probably more on cost effectiveness than comparative effectiveness. 
But what they did use will be released in 2025 for those first 10 drugs that already have prices set that have been announced for 26. But the Medicare drug price negotiation law does outline what CMS should do in terms of comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness moving forward. And so let's talk about those. And I have paraphrased below what KFF has said in a number of their briefers. So number one, use the price of therapeutic alternatives for determining the initial price offer for the maximum fair price under the law. This is net of all concessions, including rebates for Part D drugs and or the average sales price of Part B drugs. Part B drugs will be subject to negotiation in the future. So that's number one. Number two, if there are no therapeutic alternatives, CMS should use the federal supply schedule or big four agency prices. These are discount schedules negotiated for various programs of the federal government. Number three, CMS will then adjust the initial offer based on evidence about the clinical benefit of the drugs relative to its therapeutic alternatives. This includes safety concerns and side effects and whether there is a therapeutic advance or improvements in clinical outcomes. Comparative effectiveness data on patient-centered outcomes and patient experience would be looked at. And last, number four, if there are no therapeutic alternatives, evidence about the drug's clinical benefit and whether the drug fills an unmet medical need will be considered. So those are sort of four very good elements. And actually, I think what the Medicare Drug Price Negotiation Act does on comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness makes a great deal of sense. We should actually have these theories or these values in place nationally for our drug approvals, in my view, uh, but certainly for negotiating prices with drug makers. So this is an excellent step toward going down that road and begins to come much closer to what is done in assessments in other developed nations. So I'm really, really happy about those kind of things. And again, as I noted, CMS probably didn't do all of this, probably did very little of this for the 26th negotiation, but they will mature over time, as I said, and and hats off to the authors of the legislation for going down this road. So before we continue on, we'll take our next break. And when we come back from the second break, We will look at the study in the JAMA network to determine really what they found about our spending in Medicare Part D compared to what happens currently in much more mature uh, developed countries that really assessed comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness of drugs. Be right back. Lilac Software is proud to work with the Healthcare Labyrinth website to educate people on the healthcare system. At Lilac, we believe transparency is so important in healthcare. The healthcare system is opaque, and Lilac is trying to bring clarity to data and unleash the best member care, reduce costs, and improve outcomes. Our cloud-native payer platform revolutionizes data insights and analytics. Plans have all the data they need, but in silos locked away in point solutions. At Lilac, we solve the data fragmentation problem and help plans turn complex data into actionable insights leading to greater operating leverage, tight cost controls, and healthier members. Health plans can improve star scores, reduce medical expense, drive revenue, and more. Quite simply, with Lilac, you can drive better business and health outcomes. Learn more at lilacsoftware.com. Welcome back to this edition of the Healthcare Labyrinth Podcast. We hope you're enjoying it. We're talking about whether the U.S. is getting value in terms of the Part D program based on a recent JAMA Network Forum article uh, regarding this topic. So uh, with the setting of the table, so to speak, that we did on, on how other developed nations determine comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness of drugs, what did this JAMA article really say? Well, the assessment found that more than half of the 50 top drugs in the Medicare Part D program did not receive a, quote, moderate or high 
added therapeutic benefit rating by the national HTA organizations of France, Germany, or Canada. So again, let's break that down a little bit. The study looked at three entities out there, France, Germany, or Canada, and their health technology assessment organizations, which we talked about earlier. And so these organizations would look at comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness. And so what the study found is that more than half of the top 50 drugs in Medicare Part D did not get even a moderate or high added therapeutic benefit. So that's very significant. Uh, And again, it points to the fact that we're probably not getting our value. The assessment went on to determine that the 27 drugs that missed the designations accounted for $19.3 billion in net spending, 11% of Medicare net Part D costs in 2020. That's after rebates and things like that. Drugs with a low added therapeutic rating were most commonly used to treat endocrine disorders, 11 or 41%, and respiratory diseases, 6 or 22%. The study also found something very interesting beyond the sheer cost. Drugs with a lower added therapeutic rating were used by more Medicare beneficiaries. They did have lower net beneficiary spending, but that does not excuse the potential limited value of the drugs they are on. With that explanation of the JAMA analysis, let's take our last break before we come back to conclude the podcast. The Healthcare Labyrinth is no ordinary website. It features news and commentary from one of the nation's leading healthcare policy and technology experts. Mark Ryan combs the internet for the latest healthcare news and publishes a news feed each weekday with summations and Mark's insights. Twice a week, Mark publishes a blog to go deep into a current issue. And of course, Mark hosts a podcast each week to delve even further. All of this is available at healthcarelabyrinth.com. Visit each day for the latest happenings in healthcare. As well, learn more about Mark's book, The Healthcare Labyrinth, at the website. That's healthcarelabyrinth.com, your go-to source for healthcare news. Welcome back, and we hope you're enjoying this episode of the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. We're talking about, are we getting our value in the Part D program? Just to summarize now uh, what that assessment did and looked at, so... We talked about the fact that other developed nations look at uh, the comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness of drugs through their HTA organizations. They generally sort of rate the comparative effectiveness, cost effectiveness, low, medium, and high. And what this JAMA analysis found was that more than half of the top 50 drugs did not get a moderate or high rating from three of the developed nation's HTA organizations. Thus, that means that there's a big question about whether those, in this case, 27 drugs, actually are valuable spend in the Part D program. And this really emanates from the fact that we do not do comparative effectiveness and cost-effective evaluations when we are determining whether a drug is approved or not. That allows big pharma to market the heck out of different areas to prey on people as well as doctors to use drugs that may or may not be of high value. There could be legacy drugs that treat things better, or there could be not even a therapy that makes sense uh, for a given condition. Yet in America, we are overutilizing drugs in some cases. So that's really what the JAMA article found. Um, so really in conclusion, the authors say these findings could play an important part in the Medicare drug price negotiation process moving forward. As I said While uh, CMS will announce in 25 what they did on this front for the 24 negotiations for 26 drugs, I doubt very much there was much that occurred there. But this study could really help them uh, really plot a path forward in terms of what CMS will do 
on looking at comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness. The authors argue that CMS should ensure the low benefit drugs are not priced higher than reasonable therapeutic alternatives, especially with Americans paying two to three times more for brand drugs than citizens uh, in other developed countries. In the end, our FDA and our overall healthcare system emphasizes the proliferation of high cost brand drugs in given categories that fight for market share. Again, as I noted, each day patients go to their doctor and ask for a given drug that they may have seen advertised. And as well, many doctors give in to the temptation that new must be better and prescribe those requested medications or others he or she learns of. But the fact is, as this study is showing about what happens in other developed nations, very clinical and scientific-based analyses, that legacy meds that are much cheaper and other treatments could have as much therapeutic value uh, as these high-cost drugs that brand pharma and big pharma tell us that we need. Without that unbiased evaluation at the national level, and I hope it certainly begins to occur with CMS, we will continue to be victims of high costs, inefficiency, and low value in our drug world, and actually in our healthcare system overall. With that, we'll conclude this edition of the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks for joining Mark and the Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. Go to healthcarelabyrinth.com each day for the latest healthcare news. See you next week on the next Healthcare Labyrinth podcast. Thank you.